Good evening, and thank you for joining us. I'm Craig Davis, Director of Adult Services, and on behalf of everyone at the Chicago Public Library, welcome. Tonight's virtual program is another in our ongoing series of literary, cultural, and civic programming. During tonight's program, we'll be monitoring the online chat for questions from the audience for a brief Q&A following the presentation. So please feel free to ask questions in the chat. Now tonight's event marks an auspicious anniversary for it was on October 7th, 1991 that the Harold Washington Library Center first opened its doors to the public. Tonight, we celebrate the 30th anniversary of the opening of the crown jewel of the Chicago Public Library System with a program celebrating the origins and history of this very special and iconic edifice, the Harold Washington Library Center named in honor of Mayor Harold Washington. Tonight's program is titled, The Competition for the Harold Washington Library Center, and the presenter is Patrick Steffes of Docomomo, US Chicago. You'll hear from Mr. Steffes very shortly. Before we begin, I would like to happily acknowledge someone who has played a very special role in the life and success of the Harold Washington Library Center, Mr. Bob Wislow. Bob was a leader in the vision for the library, including its design and building. When the library was completed, Cindy Pritzker invited him to join the Chicago Public Library Foundation Board, where he eventually stepped in as board chair. In this role, he has led the board and foundation staff in advocating and fundraising to provide support for the library's most acclaimed programs, including the Summer Reading Program, U Media, One Book One Chicago, and so, so many more. Speaking on behalf of Commissioner Chris Brown, library staff, and patrons, thank you, Bob Wislow, for your role in the life of the Harold Washington Library Center and for your past, present, and future advocacy for the Chicago Public Library. We will be forever grateful and wish you all the best. And now it is my pleasure to present Patrick Steffes, joining us by audio to present the competition for the Harold Washington Library Center on this, the 30th anniversary of its public opening. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. My name is Patrick Steffes. Craig, thanks. I appreciate your, your very kind words and thank you to everyone who's joining us tonight. And I wanted to just kind of jump right in. I um, just wanted to give a little shout out. I'm presenting tonight on behalf of Docomomo US Chicago, which is a, an organization that um, advocates for the preservation research and sort of celebration of modern architecture. And you've got all our tags there, our Twitter, our Instagram. Um, just wanted to let you know, we'll talk about this a little bit at the end. We have something very exciting coming up called Tour Day, um, spread out over a couple of weekends, starting Saturday and next Saturday. And just wanted to give you a brief info. We've got a lot of info to cover here, folks. So <laughs> I'm going to just get started. A uh, little introduction. Um, here, here I am. I'm not on my video here, but you can hear me, I hope. And I've been a member of the board of directors of Docomoma US Chicago since 2019. I'm currently the board secretary, been on the programming committee and also helped with a book that came out in 2018 called Art Deco Chicago, Designing Modern America. And I've been an editor at Forgotten Chicago since 2012. So I just wanna give you an idea of where some of this information is coming from. Um, since 2011, and a lot of this has been at the Harold Washington Library, I've kind of taken it upon myself to go through many, many magazines that have never been digitized. Most have never even been cataloged. Um, everything from local real estate magazines that are housed at Harold Washington to local architecture magazines, online databases, and national and international architecture magazines. And I've also really made a point of going and doing a lot of in-person um, research, including extensively at the Harold Washington Library Center, including the special collections on the ninth floor, um, many institutions and universities throughout Chicago, and even across the country out in Arizona, Wisconsin, Indiana, Penn State, Cornell, and NYU. And also, I wanted to preface this by saying, we've, I've done this presentation once before on behalf of Docomomo, 
And in, in anticipation of it and to, to research, I spent four days reviewing the archives of the Harold Washington, which is on the ninth floor of, of the Harold Washington Library Center. Um, it is a fascinating and incredibly well cataloged collection of documents and notes and financial reports and all kinds of stuff. And this, especially, this is the videotape. You can tell it's a VHS tape um, of the presentation, which was just absolutely fascinating. So I'm going to start by saying, why is there the library? Why is it turning 30 years old today? And what's some of the background? Well, if any of you are longtime Chicagoans, you may realize that until 1991, Chicago did not have a central library since 1975. The purpose-built building for the Chicago Public Library opened in 1897 by the Boston firm of Shepley, Rutan, and Coolidge. And unfortunately, by 1997, as beautiful as the building was, it was overcrowded and in many ways functionally obsolete. It just could not handle the sheer volume of materials and the sheer number of people that were coming through the Chicago Public Library. So there's a lot of talk back and forth of what to do. So temporarily, um, the library would relocate to a number of locations, including the Mandelier Warehouse, which is right at the corner of Michigan and the Chicago River. This is a slide from, that's General Douglas MacArthur on a parade in 1951. A friend of mine happened to find this. Um, this enormous warehouse that was built for a department store. That was one of their temporary homes. This is a 19... 75 directory um, when they had just relocated out of there you can see this is the 12th floor of a dry goods warehouse i can't imagine what the uh probably wasn't the most pleasant place um probably hard to find things and hard to you know figure out your way around i've never been able to find images of this when it was housed as the central library i'd love to at some point um but there, there was this really gaping need for a cent new central chicago public library and here's a good, another good picture of that warehouse. The warehouse is gone um, right there. It's right next to where the Apple store is today in Pioneer Court. Um, this has been since demolished um, and rebuilt, um, but you can kind of see how the enormous size of this building and how it wouldn't probably be the most uh, pleasant place to experience a, a, a great public library like Chicago's. Um, this was a redevelopment plan. Um, a re redevelopment for this area, which is sort of known as the Dock and Canal Trust, was announced in 1969. It is still incomplete today, um, where that orange arrow is pointing as the site of the Mandelier Warehouse, which was, again, targeted for redevelopment. So one of the ideas that people were floating around, so we've got this you know, closing of the library in 1975, and it's being remodeled by Halliburton Root into what is now the Chicago Cultural Center. So there was just a lot of talk about, well, where can we put this library? So basically, I wanted to share this with you. This is from 1982. This is the Chicago Tribune. These are the, the, the department stores that are south of State Street. And you can see how many of them were closing in a very short amount of time, less than five years four of these stores closed. This is millions upon millions of square feet of space. So everyone from Goldblatt's, Sears, Montgomery Ward, and Litton's closed in this very relatively short time period. And you'll see where the Goldblatt store, which we're gonna talk about briefly, that was one of the probably farthest along plans for a new library, really not that far from the Chicago, what is now the Cultural Center, which was the former public library. And a lot of people thought, well, you know what? This is gonna be, a very cost-effective solution. The city of Chicago ended up buying it, buying the building after the company closed. They didn't go out of business, but they definitely closed that store in late 1981. So there's a Goldblatt's plan and a little bit of background. Um, Goldblatt's was opened in 19, uh, 1912 as something called the Davis Store, which was a branch of Marshall Field, which oddly failed, one of their sort of few failures. Um, Goldblatt's came in, bought it in 1936, and it was very successful for, for many, many years. You can see here, here's an ad upon the opening. This is a great design by Halbert and Roche. And what happened by the, the mid-1980s, there's really the need for this new public library, because now we're talking it's been 10 years since the main public library. Certainly, um, maybe with the exception of LA and the series of fires that they had, um, probably the only major city in the US without a main central library. So there was a plan announced in 1986 to convert the building into the Chicago Public Library. You can see they have a sort of a, a unique thing there on the left. That's where now the open plaza is. We'll kind of talk through what the building is today. Um, it, it was very well thought out. Um, it's extensively detailed. There are lots of renderings. There's different versions of the plan. Um, I don't know if they had to resubmit it, but they, you know, in many ways it would function very well as a public library. And today the 10th floor 
is the um, DePaul University's library, which I've been to many times. So here's another rendering, different plan. You've got the little thing on the left there. Here's a floor plan. This is the main floor. You've got the space, you've got the, um, you know, everything. Department stores are, are generally very overbuilt in terms of being able to support lots and lots of very heavy merchandise. So with the exception of all these pillars, which can really get in the way, the building could certainly sort of stand up to the weight of all the books and the collections in the Chicago Public Library. This is a document I found at UIC. Um, this is a city, UIC is an official re repository of city documents. So these, these things all need to be filed to the public. And I went through and scanned it. So of course that didn't happen, which we'll discuss shortly. Um, but what it did do, it was repurposed and dedicated in 1993 as DePaul Center. Here's the plaque. Um, and again, it's a great asset to the city. It's full of classrooms. As I mentioned, the library is on the top floor. There's a Barnes and Noble on the, the main straight street, Jackson Street floor. And then there's some stores um, underneath. So, you know, without doubt, very arguably a very successful conversion, but certainly not the Chicago Public Library. So now I want to go into briefly into Mayor Harold Washington and how it was really him um, and a number of his associates that were pushing so hard for a main central library. So Harold Washington was Chicago's mayor for from just four years, although he did win a second term um, and unfortunately died several months into that term. Here he is. This is a wonderful photo. It looks like it's a promotional one uh, photo when the Chicago Bears were about to uh, go to the Super Bowl. He's probably uh, calling the, uh, the opposing team's mayor and giving him a hard time. Um, you know, these great images. Um, the thing to remember about Harold Washington was he was a very, very big booster in not only the neighborhoods, but the loop. And I think um, Mayor Washington had the vision to know how important it was <clears throat> for Chicago to have a very vital core and you know, lots of development and lots of things coming from there and make it accessible to everyone who lived in Chicago and to visitors. And also it was important to remember, Harold Washington was perhaps the greatest reader we've ever had as a mayor. He, I, I've read accounts of him having literally wor working on 10 books at the same time. Like, I can't imagine what his nightstand looked like, but he was a voracious reader. And for him, a library was, was key to a Chicago cultural <clears throat> life. So here's a, in some interesting dates to keep in mind. So Washington had this very strong priority in building a public library. <clears throat> Excuse me. The, um, there was a bond of $175 million was approved in July of 1987. The mayor named the competition jury, which we'll discuss shortly, in November 1987. And that's the same month that he died. So this is all coming to a head very quickly. And unfortunately, Mayor Washington died in his office on the fifth floor of City Hall on November 25th, 1987. The Chicago City Council uh, named the library in his honor within two weeks of his very untimely death. So briefly, I also wanted to discuss how the reputation of Chicago's South State Street in general and the 400 block in particular um, was really seen by a lot of people as something that had to be eliminated and removed. So um, this is a wonderful series of images I've seen. This is also housed at Special Collections up on the ninth floor of Harold Washington. And this is part of the Chicago Loop Alliance collection. This is literally, you can see at the bottom, those are the street numbers of the 400 block of State Street. So that corner there, this is all where the Harold Washington Library sits right now. But these super high res images that I've certainly never seen before and have never seen republished, but it's a collection of buildings that are date from the, you know, the 1890s, probably 1900, 1910 and really didn't change at all. If you kind of look at these and look for clues, we've got an image later that I think you'll enjoy. And then you go further down, you can see, and there's taverns and there's, you know, sort of tattoo par parlors later and all that kind of thing. So, you know, I'm certainly fine looking buildings, but by, uh, by the 1980s, this is certainly getting to be a little tired. And, you know, you're talking literally the gateway to Chicago. You're, you know, right across from the Sears store, their flagship store by the, which would close, of course, um, right on facing Congress Avenue. I mean, this is a, a little bit of an embarrassment in the sense that there's a very vital gateway to the city of Chicago. So, and also this is no secret that the, the South, South State Street and the South was really not seen in very popular opinion. Um, Architectural Forum had a special issue on the Chicago World's Fair and they claimed it was horrendous, not, not my words. Um, and they talk about the burlesque shows and the midget radios. So uh, midget radios are sort of tabletop radios that were very popular in the 1930s. So there's a, even a national sense that, th that this is an area that's really 
um, hit a steep decline. Um, this is one of my favorite books on Chicago. It's, if you read it now, it's very offensive in their language and um, very problematic in some ways, but it's also a very descriptive um, way to discuss the South Loop. And they talk about um, various places that are <laughs> going full blast at 2.30 in the afternoon. Um, they talk about degenerates and they say it's as lousy as any skid row in the country. Um, and then they have this quote, lousy Bagnio's assignator coops, barrel houses and decrepit deadfalls, which I guess is 50 speak for stay out of the area. Um, and then some even more offensive language, which I've covered up um, on the corner of State and Van Buren, but the summary was State Street Stinks. But again, a very out of date and somewhat problematic book, but very interesting and influential. And the, I know the Chicago Public Library does have copies in their collection if you wanna know about uh, what South State Street and the South Loop was in the 1940s and 50s. There you go. So there's a lot of schemes over the years. How are we gonna clean up State Street? Um, we really haven't gotten to this, this specific block, the 400 block between Congress and Van Buren, but there's a lot of schemes over the years. And the, probably the most famous was in 1978, ground was broken for what became the State Street Mall. So you've got um, Mayor Balandic and James Bade from left to right of the State Street Council with the ceremonial ground, groundbreaking. Um, so what they do, if any of you are newer, newer to Chicago, from Congress all the way to Lake, I believe. Yes, Lake Street. Um, this street was closed to auto traffic. It was allowed for buses and for taxis, um, but it was a very curious design. This is happening all over the country and the sort of the signature of the plan for State Street was this incredibly wide sidewalks, very narrow traffic lanes that sort of snake through the area. So everything is like sort of a serpentine, these really oversized and overscaled bus shelters <clears throat> with some access to the CTA lines, which are below, of course, but it didn't really live up fully to its, its potential. Um, here's a, just gives you an idea of on the bottom there is what, how it was built. So you have these, the existing street at the top, you know, which is a standard big city, major commercial thoroughfare. And then down below um, the sidewalks are incredibly wide. Um, they planted trees. I don't think all of those lived with all the diesel fumes and the bus pollution. So it was a, it had some good intentions, but it, it ultimately wasn't successful. It's worth noting it was very, very successful at the beginning. It was dedicated in October of 1979. Huge crowds. Um, I read the reports of the what, what was the Greater State Street Council now is the Loop Alliance, and they reported sales increased dramatically over the first few years. So it was very successful when it opened. Um, it just in later years, it just kind of I think it sort of lost its appeal. You can see the the number of people that were there for the dedication at State Madison. But the reality, and I can remember this, the reality was um, it was very barren and it was all made of gray. So it had gray sort of granite pavers, gray street furniture. Um, the trees didn't last for very long, like I said. So it was this very almost intimidating way of being on State Street. Like the sidewalks were almost too wide, if that makes sense. Like there's something so vital about the Chicago Loop where you're, you're in an area and it's just sort of bustling with people and you, you get close up to the windows. This was not that effect. So um, within several years, this was really seen as a, a failure to be gotten rid of. And again, I wanted to point this out. This is from uh, 1982. Those are those same buildings that we saw before from 19, literally the exact same buildings and some of the same storefronts. So the 400 block of State Street in all of this time, there's your State Street Mall. You do have some trees in the middle. Um, th this hasn't changed at all. I mean, this is just the same um, sort of problematic block in the loop. So we're gonna move forward. So that gives you a little bit of background. What's going on in the city? What's going on in State Street? How Mayor Washington was so committed to not using the Goldblatt's plan, but to do a completely new building. And the city would eventually acquire through eminent domain, all of the buildings in the 400 block of State Street. So everything you see, the, the Harold Washington Library Center stands today that was all acquired. It was, everything was torn down, paved over. It was a parking lot for a couple of years. and then. Um, eventually construction would begin on the library itself. So this is important. This is the people, these are the people that Mayor Washington named um, very soon before he died in 1987. So I won't go through all of them, um, but there's some very important people here, some great civic leaders, including the executive editor of Ebony Johnson Publishing, um, the former SVP of First Chicago Bank, the director of the Washington Public Library, Ping Tom, um, who has a, a park named after him in Chinatown. And of course, Cindy Pritzker, uh, who is on the board of directors of the Chicago Hog Library. So some, some very prominent people and very, a very diverse crowd. And also the, notably, note this name, Vincent Scully, 
who was at the Department of History at Yale University. And those are the folks um, that were, they were paid, the out-of-towners were paid, um, which, you know, a nominal amount, this is a, a really an enormous amount of work. Um, and then a couple of them had their expenses paid as well. So what they decided to do for the Harold Washington, which is something relatively new in Chicago, it's something called a design build competition. And that is where you have one firm that consists of a, an architecture firm, and then you have a construction firm, and you have an engineering firm, and they all kind of collaborate together to form this sort of new entity. So their responsibility, if they say, you know, you're gonna build us a library for $175 million, this one entity has to make sure it happens from the, the, the marble supplier, to the electrician, to the excavation, to everything. So it just goes to one overseeing entity. Um, because before we, Chicago was sort of notorious for a lot of these very dramatic cost overruns where you have one engineer and you have one architecture firm and you have one construction company, but this is all kind of wrapped up together. So as we go through this, I want you to notice um, there's some pretty prominent architectural firms and also you'll notice some very prominent construction firms as well. So wanted to start by who didn't make the cut? Um, this is the first one, the only of the firms that did not make the final competition. So this is uh, called the Amistad Group. It was Eisenman Robertson uh, and the Austin Company. The Austin Company is a very prominent nationwide construction company. Peter Eisenman is really notable as a sort of proponent of deconstructionist architecture. Here's one of his buildings. And I wanted to show everyone sample buildings from right around the time of the competition. So remember, the firms are, are being started to be named in 1988 and the building opens in 1991. So I was trying to find representative buildings of what were they doing at that time. So this is very typical of the work of Peter Eisenman. They were not selected. Um, I don't know if they didn't meet all the criteria, but they would not be part of the final competition and we will say no more of them. But the ones that were in competition, and you also have to remember what's very unusual about this, this was probably one of the most prominent civic architecture competitions in the country. In the 1980s, you've got a $175 million public library, um, you know, flagship for the entire Chicago public library system. And you'll see there are very few firms in competition. So the first one um, is called, I want to start with the architects. It's live called Library 88. And they have, curiously, they have two architects that are part of this one entity, Chicago by Skidmore, Owens and Merrill. This is what they were doing at the time. This is Chicago Place, um, which is of course on Michigan Avenue, um, which has been, if you may, may or may not know this, the, re, the mall portion, the retail shops and the ground floor are open. The hotel is open and the condos are open, but the mall portion has been closed since um, 2009. So it's a completely abandoned mall sitting right there on Michigan Avenue. But remember this image because you're gonna see something that looks very familiar to this very shortly. So the second firm in Library 88 was um, Mexico City-based um, architect Ricardo Legareta and his firm. And this type of stuff he was doing at the time was very, very different. It was very sort of clean cut. These are the dorms down at University of Chicago from 2002. A lot of very bold colors. He works a lot in uh, Mexico, of course, and in California and in Texas. So it's a very sort of um, Southwest feel, very Mexican feel. So uh, again, a very curious choice of, of these two to work together. Also in competition is the uh, John Buck Company, which is the firm of Arthur Erickson, who is a perhaps Canada's most notable architect, did a lot of very prominent buildings, including the Canadian Chancellery in Washington, DC. And again, if you look at this, you're gonna see something very familiar coming up um, in that firm. And Metropolitan Lohan, which was the firm of Dirk Lohan and Metropolitan Structures, this is also um, an abandoned building. This is out in Oak Brook. This is the former headquarters of McDonald's in 1984. Um, my, my friend there, Sarah Kretzky, who's a photographer, we've gone out to the site several times to try to document it in case it gets torn down. Um, we're, we're very much a proponent of sort of documenting and um, researching these, these very late buildings that people seem to be not paying a lot of attention to. Also in competition was the firm of, of Murphy Yan, which was led at the time by Helmut Yan, who I'll, I'm sure most of you know, is called the Chicago Library Team. Um, of course, Helmut Yan's firm had very famously opened in 1985 the State of Illinois building, later the James R. Thompson Center, um, which we'll get, we'll get into a little bit how that this may have been uh, very detrimental to his, his bid. And then also something called the Cebus Group, 
which is a Chicago-based firm of Thomas Beebe. And here is a great example of another Chicago Public Library building. This is the Sulzer Regional Library, which is over at Montrose and Lincoln. This opened in 1985 and was seen as very, very successful, very popular with the patrons and the staff. And so I'm just giving you this to let, you know, they may have had a little bit of an, an early up in the competition because they just completed something for Chicago Public Library and it was widely seen as very successful. So here we go. These are the submitted designs. Again, <clears throat> the what happens was starting in 1987 and 88, these firms and these design build firms are submitting their proposals all wrapped together in one with sort of one liability and one uh, point of contact. And they're working very feverishly on this massive, massive public building. Um, and we're gonna go through those right now. So the first one is Library 88 Partnership, again, with Skidmore, Owings, Merrill, and Ricardo Lagaretta. And then their construction partner was Morse Diesel, Inc. And you can see that here. And if you saw um, the Chicago Place image before, you'll see a very similar sort of look to this. So they were kind of on a, uh, a sort of a tear at the time with this, this sort of work. But what's curious, you have this somewhat very traditional, very high postmodern um, sort of exterior. But what's very curious about it, um, Adrian Smith was a partner at Skidmore, Owings and Merrill at the time, and he was, was and is a, you know, he, Adrian Smith is responsible for literally building the world's tallest building out in Dubai, and everything he does is, is very high tech and very sort of machine age and, and, and really high tech. So you've got this strange interior, uh, this beautiful atrium that with that kind of odd exterior with this sort of, it, it's a kind of a mishmash. I, I don't, don't want to put my personal opinions here, but it's a, it's a very curious design of all of them. This is also, these pictures aren't the best images, I apologize, they're taken from slides, from the actual slideshow competition, but this shows you that atrium, that great atrium with the glass elevators going through. It would have been a very dramatic addition. Here's a lobby, which again is this sort of kind of odd sort of mashup of this very traditional pomo and this little bit of a high tech thrown in. Okay, next up is we've got company is John Buck Company, which is Arthur Erickson, as we mentioned, and Turner Construction, which is a you know leading huge national construction firm. Um, here's their design. Now, <clears throat> when the, the rules were announced and everything went out, everybody was very clear that not only could you use the 400 block of State Street, you could use the block to the north. So if you're familiar in the area around the building, there's something called Pritzker Park. That was also available to people, to the design build firms, if they wanted to use it. So you'll see two of these use, make that solution. Um, there's advantages to it. There's some disadvantages to it. Um, here's a better shot. This is the daytime. You see where that started. You can see the L. It's a little hard to see, but there's the L um, going through the middle of the building. In the foreground is this very dramatic water park that's basically where Pritzker Park is today. The problem was, um, it's, this is, the Harold Washington Library is an enormous to begin with, but then you take about you know, another third of a block to the north and you're talking, you know, you might as well get out your roller skates if you're shelving books because it's going to be so big. So you've got an enormous building. You can make it a little bit lower, um, but it's a very sort of, this is a very curious way. And it has a lot of similarities, as you may have seen, to the Canadian, what's now the Canadian Embassy in Washington, D.C. Again, not the best quality. I apologize. These are also taken from slides. But also just shows you that just how, you know, again, enormous and it's very, Hard to see how this relates to Chicago or to the Chicago Loop or to the buildings nearby. It's a, again, it's a very curious choice. Next up, we have Metropolitan Lohan, which was uh, Dirk Lohan's firm. Dirk Lohan is the grandson of the great Chicago architect, Mies van der Rohe, and Metropolitan Structures. And Dirk Lohan's firm is very sort of stripped down, very modern, uh, very much of his time. He has a great ability to use materials in a way that's really sophisticated, have a very modern look that's also very unique, but it's not this very sort of stripped down um, modernism that sometimes you see with a lot of other buildings. Very dramatic entrance. It's kind of hard to get this from the rendering, but the design was you would walk in those main doors in the center and then flanking it on either side were these grand staircases on both sides. So it was this very welcoming. It was meant to represent an open book uh, with these stairs flanking this main entrance. Uh, you know, again, very, you know, sophisticated, very modern, very of its time, very Chicago. He's got a lot of sort of Chicago. You got the Chicago windows going on. You've got a lot of metal detailing, a very, uh, very interesting design in, in my opinion. 
And again, here it just gives you a, an idea of what that very dramatic, there's only one of the two staircases that meant to sort of lead you up into the entire building. And then finally, we have, oh, not finally, next to last, we have the Chicago Library team, which is Murphy Yan and Passion Contractors. Again, here's a, here's a rendering. I have a few better ones coming up. Uh, this is a great one. This also shows you how it very dramatically bridges over the um, L at Van Buren. There you see the building is sort of set on both sides of this very dramatically, very, very long building. This is sort of a, show, you know, looking, this is from Congress Street, looking through that great barrel vault that runs through the entire length of the building. <clears throat> and then finally, we have the CBIS group, which is Hammond, Beebe, and Babka, and A. Epstein and Sons. A. Epstein is a very prominent Chicago um, construction and engineering and design firm. So here, as we all know, this is the library we have today. Um, all of these images are taken from when they made their presentation in 1988 to the jury. Very little of this changed. Um, everything original you can see was part of the original design of the building. Um, but again, this is markedly very different from the rest. It's got this um, great color, as you can see. Um, it's very Chicago in the sense that it's got this many, many sort of Chicago design cues. Um, very notably, it fits to the height of the building across the street, which is the Leader Building, which is the former location of Sears Roebuck, which is a very important sort of early steel frame building. So this is very, very much in the context of the site. But let's get to the jury. So again, here's the jury. They meet July, or I'm sorry, June 16th to 18th, 1988. Um, here are folks again from the jury and are all, most of them very opinionated. So we're going to go through what the jury had to say and when these were eliminated. So here's, again, the Skidmore Legaretta design, um, which we mentioned very, very similar in many ways to Chicago Place. And again, I, I'm, I had the, the, the great opportunity to go through and to read the, the jury notes and watch the video presentations. Um, a little clunky um, in terms of the videotape. It just was. I think people's appreciation of good quality video and that has changed drastically since then. So some of the comments were, Henry Cobb said there's too many cooks. Uh, someone said it looked like a high class jail. And my favorite, Vincent Scully said, it is all too much. So needless to say, this was the first of the jury design or the design that was eliminated from the jury. What they did was they voted on all of them, eliminated one and kept going until they had a final winner. Next up, we have the John Buck Company with the Arthur Erickson and Turner Construction. And Arthur Erickson has not ever completed a building um, before or since in the Midwest, so he was a, sort of a curious choice. Um, I read through their presentation binder. It had very strange spelling errors, such as um, LeBaron Jennings. And the video type presentation that I watched really didn't, didn't talk about how the context, the site, the relationship of anything really through there. Uh, Vincent Scully helpfully noted that it reminded him of a Houston or Marin County shopping center. Uh, Vincent Scully also said it fades fast, the scale is overblown, and another juror said it would be wrong to select this proposal. So as you may have guessed, this is the second design that was to be eliminated. Moving on, we have uh, Metropolitan Lohan. Again, Dirk Lohan was Mies van der Rohe's grandson. and has a very prominent local architect and has worked throughout Chicago and the US. Um, one of the librarians <clears throat> in the comments said she really liked this because it didn't seem to be um, designed by committee like the one from Skidmore. And the video type presentation was, was kind of entertaining because it was taped in their office and you can hear the phone ringing and coworkers talking behind the microphone. So some of the comments on this was uh, Ping Tom said it has little appeal. Uh, Cindy Pritzker says the outside leaves me cold. And a professor at Northwestern said it looked like a factory. So as you may have guessed, this one was also eliminated. Moving on, we have the Chicago library team of Murphy Yan and Passion Contractors. Helmut Yan and his state of Illinois building got worldwide attention in not always the best ways due to a lot of, um, there's some structural challenges, some budget constraints. Um, air conditioning systems, uh, I won't go on about that, but um, that was a very incredible, one of the highest profile buildings in Chicago in the 1980s, um, and that may have worked to his disadvantage. <clears throat> but I will say, his videotape presentation explained the site and the design well, 
um, and also repeatedly had um, Mr. Jan's hand pointing to the model, but did a very good job in presenting the merits and the advantages to this particular design. Um, Henry Cobb said he saluted the panache, clarity, and generosity. Um, someone said it had cutesy geometric shapes. And Cindy Pritzker noted it would be a nightmare to function and a disaster for user staff and maintenance. So needless to say, this was the fourth and final of the designs to be eliminated. So we finally get to um, the selection that was chosen, which is Hammond, Beebe and Babka and A. Epstein and Sons. And again, we mentioned earlier, the Selzer Library was seen, won, AI, the national, or won a local AIA award, popular with users and the public. And what was really remarkable about their presentation was he was very um, pragmatic about the building. And he said, it's incredibly flexible. It's very adaptable. He said it will be completely usable in 150 years. I don't think a lot of these firms were thinking ahead until the year 2000, but you know, the, this firm is really thinking ahead as this is not a, only a civic building, but it's really going to um, be functional and usable in many years. And as tonight on the 30th anniversary of the building, I think we could certainly agree We've got 120 years to go, but we're, we're certainly going strong. So here are some of the comments on this. Um, we have, you can read them, extraordinary, riveting, another monument in Chicago's tradition of architectural leadership, very forward looking and world class. And this is it. So there was a great, um, again, I think it's helpful to explain the process of selecting the design of the building. Cause I think some people think, oh, it just was someone knew so-and-so. It was a very um, pragmatic approach and the mayor was smart enough to choose people with really different backgrounds, um, some with no architectural background, some with library backgrounds, some teaching architectural history, um, seemed to be a very well chosen jury. Here's the announcement in the Chicago Tribune, um, you know, talking about the design. And also, I wanted to mention that there was, there was also a, an, a period where the public could view the models at the Chicago Cultural Center, the, of course, the former home of the library, and make comments. And I know that Harold Washington has actually saved all the comment cards. Um, I unfortunately didn't have time to go through them. And I also don't know, I don't know if there was like a voting um, period for that, like if you could actually vote. I don't think that was the idea. I think they, it was very clear from the beginning that this was a design build competition chosen by a selected jury. This was not a popularity contest or not a you know, public vote on this. Um, but you know, I, again, I'm sure there are lots and lots of different things to say, but I think it would be a very interesting thing to go through and read that. So also um, wanted to let people know that the, the, sculpt, the very prominent sculptures you see, um, the sort of on the cornice there, the owls, those were not installed until nearly two years after the building opened. Um, they're designed by Kingsburg. They obviously are very large and had to be fabricated. They were part of the original design and they were part of the original budget. So there was some um, consternation of folks saying, well, why are you putting that in? Can the money go somewhere else? Well, it was already part of the budget. It was approved as a part of the bond. So it just took a couple of years for them to be fabricated and installed. So I wanted to make that clear to folks. So here at the time, so this is 1991, um, when the library opens. So Paul Gap was the um, architectural critic of the Chicago Tribune at the time. And he won the Pulitzer Prize for Criticism in 1979. He was their critic from 1974 to 1992. Um, Paul Gap is nothing if not um, opinionated and animated. So he had some very clever things to say um, upon the opening of Water Tower Place. He called it an animated mausoleum. He famously described the Marriott on Michigan Avenue as a touch of crass. So there's no lack of opinion with Paul Gap. So I wanted to start, Paul Gap, um, he had good things and bad things to say. Um, I did want to explain some of the negative, more negative things he said. Um, he thought it was very leaden. He thought it flirted with kitsch. Um, he was not in favor, many of the, the ideas, the very overt historical uh, reference that, that the building made. So again, that was his opinion. He was the architecture critic for the Chicago Tribune. However, he also um, was very enthused about a lot of the building. And he said, he said this, this again, this is soon after the building opened in 1991. He said it was an unqualified functional success. He said, and this is something I hadn't even noticed and I've been in the library so many times but I didn't even notice this until I read his article or his review. He said that the clever changes in ceiling height and floor coverings subtly steer people along almost sublim subliminally defined routes, which is true. If you're in the building, 
it is very, very, if you pick a floor, you know, say the fourth, third, fourth floor, um, you can basically, if you stand in the right place, you can see all to all the corners, you know where everything is, you can tell where the escalator banks are, the elevators in a very clear, logical position. Um, so he was, he really made a point of, of noting that, which is a very hard thing to do in an, an enormous building such as Harold Washington Library Center. And um, Thomas Beebe also said, or I'm sorry, Paul Gap also said that the building has a total flexibility for the future. So I just wanted to briefly um, wrap up and to kind of talk about the building, why I've always found this so interesting and that, you know, if you're, if you're inter interested in Chicago architecture, there's no doubt that you've heard about the competition for the Chicago Tribune, which was one of, arguably one of the world's most famous, or certainly in the US, famous architectural competitions. There have been multiple books written about this, um, multiple stories. There have been late competitions to it, late entries to it. But in contrast, this building, I have never seen this competition, certainly the subject of a book or widely referenced in other um, architecture books on Chicago. It was just one of those things where it happened and it was a really big deal and it was over and it was done. And it was really un very much forgotten, which is again, why I'm so um, thrilled here today to talk about this competition. So, but one of the things that's great about it um, that, that a lot of you may not know, and I didn't, I lived here for many years before I figured this out, is that all of the models for the ones that didn't make it are on display on the eighth floor of Harold Washington Library. It's a little hard to find. It's in the southeast corner of the building. So here you've got, um, this is the, the Skidmore and Ricardo, Ricardo Legaretta, and they're these very nicely designed um, models. You really get a sense of how they would have looked had they been built. They're contextual. You've got the, you know, the L, all of that. You've got Congress Street on the left there. Um, this is a shot of, this gives you an idea. This is the Erickson model with the L going right through the heart of the building. And then on the lower right, that's where Pritzker Park is today. Gives you a sense of the context of how he was gonna fit this building into the site. You've got the, the Dirk Lohan program, um, which is looking there at State Street on the right. You can see the sort of remnants. You can still see the, the State Street Mall there um, and Congress Street, of course, and these very dramatic entrances for that and how it, it integrates into the rest of the buildings. And then of course the Helmut Jan, again, how that integrates and how that's set up. You see again, the L running through on the right-hand side through the, through the heart of the building. And then I just wanted to conclude a couple of things. We're gonna turn this back, I'll turn this back over to Craig. Um, just wanted to give a quick shout out. So again, I'm affiliated with Docomomo, Chicago uh, presenting on behalf of them. Wanted to let you know that we have something called Tour Day. Um, it's over two weekends. We've got one event this coming Saturday. It's gonna be out at the Schweiker House in Schaumburg. If none of you have seen it, it's a really remarkable um, 19, early 1940s, um, very sort of the Usonian style, which is a sort of very ground hugging, um, natural materials. They're having an event this Saturday, October 9th. Tickets are available on the Schweiker House website. And then also I wanted to let you know that I will be leading um, a week from Saturday on Saturday, October 16th, a walking tour of Peterson Avenue, uh, which is a really fascinating collection of mid-century modern commercial buildings in Chicago that you, you've probably been by, but if you've been by, been in a car and you, you're going fast, this is a really up close. We're gonna walk around. We talk about a lot of the architects. Um, it's a real, gonna be a really fun time and the tickets are going very, very quickly. So if you're interested, I would recommend um, doing that at the Docomomo website. And then also I wanted to conclude um, before I turn it back over to Craig is just to say what, you know, having the, all the ups and downs of this site and the history of the south, this part of South State Street and South, you know, the South Loop um, in all the years it took. I mean, it's 16 years without a library until this opened, but I think the end of it, um, what we've le been left with was this, is this absolutely extraordinary public asset. And one of the criticisms that I've heard from people is they sort of, they sort of bulk at the, the sort of almost luxury to it, like the materials used, the marbles and, the, and everything. And, um, I always I always point out to them how extraordinarily the building has been maintained and is held up. And also, if you go and you do any studying there, you'll notice that the, the very heavy furniture, like these incredibly thick, heavy, sturdy desks and chairs, and I, I would argue that I bet a lot of them are original. They're probably 30 years old. I can't imagine the amount of people that are going through that library every day and doing research. I'm certainly there all the time. So I think what we're left with is 
um, you know, not only an incredible legacy um, to the, 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 you know, the mayor, Mayor Harold Washington and his, his great effect on Chicago, but we're left with a truly world-class building, which is just, you know, such a thrill and just delights people. This is, of course, is the ninth floor Winter Garden, which if, if you haven't seen it, hopefully you have, but head up there because it's an extraordinary sight. And I just wanted to end, I'm going to turn this back over to Craig. Uh, and he's going to talk a little bit about um, the Harold Washington cent Centennial that's coming up next year. Thank you, Patrick. And your presentation was wonderful. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Harold Washington Centennial that's coming up. And then I'm going to present you with a couple of questions that we received regarding your presentation. But uh, first of all, I'd like to let everyone know who's listening that 20, on April 15th, 2022, that will mark the exact centennial celebration of the late mayor Harold Washington's birth. So there have been activities planned beginning this fall running through his birthday in April and possibly uh, for a time afterwards. Tonight's program is a launch program for the Chicago Public Library that celebrates the legacy of Mayor Harold Washington. We're very pleased to present this as part of our legacy programming to Mayor Washington. And I will also tell you that in partnership with the Mayor where, uh, Harold Washington Legacy Committee, the History Makers and other prominent organizations and educational institutions, the Harold Washington Library Center will host a major centennial event on April 14th, which is a Thursday, 2022, to celebrate his 100th birthday. And you might think, why aren't we celebrating it on the actual birthday of April 15th? It's because it's Good Friday in 2022. So we've moved it to Thursday evening, April 14th. And please watch the Chicago Public Library website at chicagopubliclibrary.org for more information that will be released after the new year passes on this exciting centennial event. Uh, and also watch our website for a wide variety of other programmings that we off offer for Chicagoans of all ages from cradle to grave, one might say, which we're very pleased to do. So um, Patrick, back to a, a question that we, uh, that we had. Um, I don't know if you touched on this much during your presentation, but for those of us who worked down here prior to the building of this, the area had sort of a reputation as a seedy, almost red light district. Can you comment a bit about the impact that the building of this library and the demolition of that sort of derelict area has had on this area? We, we look at it now and people who may not have known the area at the time may not realize what it looked like 30 years ago. Sure, no, that's a great question. And um, I wanted to say, I think the, th this building opening in 1991 was, was really the, the key to get this started, but then just not as importantly, but another major event was just you know two years later when the DePaul Center opened. So there've always been schools in the South, the South Loop. A lot of, you know, Columbia has been around for quite a while, but you start to see in the 1990s, this huge influx of people. And of course there's that enormous dorm that's Kitty Corner from Harold Washington. So I think the Harold Washington Library Center was really the start to all of this redevelopment and this incredible amount of investment. And, you know, more importantly, people living in, in the South Loop. So if you have people living in the area, um, you know, the South Loop became very, very popular place to live with Dearborn Center and all of that. So, you know, I, without this, I think it's, it's almost hard to imagine that you would have had the same level, you know, the hundreds of millions of dollars of investment without this as sort of the linchpin and the centerpiece of all of that. So I, I don't think the, the, the influence of this building can be overstated in any way. Yeah, I would agree with you on that. Um, uh, we have another question. You may have touched on this earlier, but please remind us, was Mayor Washington present when ground was broken for this building? He was not. So he named the competition jury in November of 1987. He died soon after. So the bid would go out um, soon after that. So starting in early 1988, the bids are coming in. The design is chosen in June of 1988 and construction would begin an excavation later that year. So no, unfortunately, 
Um, he did not live to see the final design, nor did he live to see the groundbreaking. Thank you. Um, I think that's about all the questions that I have about all the time we have for tonight, right now. Um, so uh, I would just like to add on a personal note that I have been working out of this building for 20 years and I have to say it's a very comfortable and beautiful and magnificent second home for me. And I know my colleagues who work in this building feel the same way. So. I hope that everyone listening jo will join with me in appreciating the impact that the Harold Washington Library Center has had on the city and as the crown jewel building of the extensive Chicago Public Library System, one of the greatest systems in the country. I would encourage you to visit not only this building, the Harold Washington Library Center, but the 80 other locations we have in all neighborhoods throughout the city. Tonight's program, if you weren't able to catch the whole thing, it will be available on the Chicago Public Library YouTube page. So if you have friends who weren't able to join us tonight or you wanna see it again, please take the time to watch it on our Facebook and or YouTube channels. And as I said, do not forget to visit the Chicago Public Library's website, chicagopubliclibrary.org. And if you do not have, or you have an outdated Chicago Public Library card, I encourage you to go to any of our locations to renew that card. It's a very simple process. Uh, please do so. You will not regret it afterwards. So at this point, it's time for me to say good evening. I would like to thank everyone involved in this program and a special thanks to the library's technical and marketing teams. Patrick Steffes, thank you for providing an invaluable program as we launch our centennial programming in memory of the late Mayor Harold Washington. Thanks for all of you for listening and have a wonderful evening. <laughs>